Uh, hi everyone and welcome to the SFP uh, student chapter of the University of Queensland. Um, we were going to give uh, another two minutes for any uh, latecomers uh, to join us and we'll start with a, a brief introduction uh, of David and we'll pass on the baton to David afterwards to uh, carry out the presentation. A bit of um, housekeeping rules. Uh, if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to pop them uh, in the chat and we will answer them at the end of the uh, presentation. And if you could please keep yourself uh, yourself muted during the presentation, that would be great. Thank you. All right, I think we're probably going to start. We've got almost uh, well, 60 plus people, including some of us in the room. So uh, hopefully we can uh, exceed last week's target of 70 plus people. Uh, <laughs> So um, I'll start with a brief intro uh, of David. I'm just going to read off the slide and I think I'm just going to add a few more things that I know about David because I've had the pleasure to uh, work with him. Um, so David is a, a principal with Arab. Uh, he specializes in the fire safe design and approval of uh, mass timber buildings. Uh, David has, uh, has, has worked over 25 years uh, in, in the industry and predominantly uh, in the US. Uh, has done a lot of projects in, uh, in Europe as well and, and now he's is back uh, in, in Australia, specifically in Melbourne. Um, and he, he, he works with clients and, and, and companies uh, uh, to develop new timber technologies, authorizing design guides, assisting with codes. Uh, there's been recent posts on LinkedIn. I know probably you've seen them about an FBA uh, and, and completing engineering design solutions from uh, mid-rise and, and high-rise timber buildings. I would say most of the time it's high-rise I think David. Um, yeah, David leads a, a global uh, team uh, that works with developers, architects, uh, researchers to enab enable mass timber structures. And, and I had the pleasure to participate in some of these meetings personally. And, and it's fantastic. The, the team is, is comprised of people from across the globe. Um, so there's a lot of uh, exchange of ideas there. Um, also, David has authored and co authored. A number of papers and then he, he's very active not only in industry but but in, in academia um so i'm sure some of you uh will, will catch him up in in upcoming conferences uh this year around the the space of of, of timber and fire safety um i will uh, pass the baton out to you david if there's anything else you would like to add about yourself uh feel free and then we can start with the presentation um everyone is muted uh, as i said earlier uh, for those who hadn't joined us in the beginning. I, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat and, and we'll go through one by one at the end. So thank, thank you, David. I'll uh, leave it up to you now. Thanks, Stephros. That's a very nice um, introduction there. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay, just uh, to share this. Okay, all right. Um, well, first of all, thanks for um, the you know University of Queensland chapter for inviting me along. Um, it's great to present and and talk to everybody um, about mass timber and fire safety. I'm going to you know go through this maybe 40, 45 minutes and keep it fairly sort of I suppose um, fairly sort of informal in some ways and um, cover a few topics and go through a few um, ideas and areas which I think we need to look at from a research point of view and um yeah and then looking forward to some discussion and questions afterwards and um you know hope this is somewhat um interactive as well um so what i want to talk about is i suppose you know why we're using mass timber and what is being built and i think it's important to understand um in the context of fire safety you know what is being built and why um and the sort of the trends that we're seeing um driven by architects and developers and then start to talk about the research and some of the, I'm sort of gonna concentrate really on certain areas of um, the research that has gone on um, over sort of the past, I suppose, recent years, more the last sort of 10 years, um, which I think has been significantly influential for mass timber construction. Um, and then let's dive into some of the areas a little, more, a little bit more deeply, mainly because they're um, areas that I think we need to spend more work more time on, have more work on, um, and topics of research, which I think are important now um, and will probably be important, I think, in the near future as well. So from my point of view, I, I, if you see me present, I quite often um, put this slide up because I think it's one of the easiest ways for someone like me to understand about um, the complexities of embodied carbon um, and sustainability of buildings. 
Um, so I continue to use it because I can explain it um, because, you know, life cycle assessments are quite complicated um, when it comes to timber and dealing with everything related to timber um, is, I find, really interesting from a sustainability point of view, not only things like forestry certification schemes, but also how we account for um, everything related to sustainability in buildings nowadays and can do it in a very numeric and data-driven way. Um, I think it's you know coming a uh, coming a long way for, for us to look at and understand what a sustainable building means. And it's not about just turning the lights off um, at night, which is you know the operational carbon side. It's all about the embodied carbon and what goes into that and the structure, um, the substructure, all those elements which go into make up a building is where mass timber can have a significant impact on the overall embodied carbon of a building and. Um, if you are interested in this, um, you know, there is some amazing um, publications out there about life cycle assessments um, and some ways the important aspects that go into that, especially in some ways at the front end related to timber around transportation. But I think even more importantly, things like, you know, the production of timber and, you know, what goes into CLT and where does the power come from that powers, you know, the plants that make the CLT and how important is that? So there's a real level of detail which can come into um, determining what is a sustainable building and um, I think we are getting you know very quickly into the, the realm of you know using a significant amount of data and using that in the right way to be able to determine how sustainable buildings are and you know timber is right at the forefront of that and you know it's up to us as everybody involved in the construction industry to have more sustainable buildings. We need to be doing this. We need to be finding ways to enable more sustainable buildings. So, if, you know, from my point of view as an engineer, when it comes to fire safety and timber, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, you know, we want to have as many timber buildings as possible. And I'm quite open about that. You know, as far as I can see, it's all about getting more um, timber in the construction because it's all about how we change the embodied carbon equation and, and get more, um, you know, green and sustainable construction. So, you know, I think importantly for this, it's about, you know, discussion around low, medium and high rise buildings. And, and I, I want to raise this firstly, because I think it sets the context for this presentation and a lot of discussion around mass timber, because and this, a lot of it comes about because I have, you know, in some ways my working day is typically dealing with a lot of developers, contractors, owners and architects who want to build and, you know, want to have um, mass timber buildings. And, a lot of it is seeing mass timber construction that is already built or is in magazines or is on websites and, and seeing some of that and, and looking at it and being sort of inspired and saying, you know, I want to build one of those. I want to have one of those. I want to, you know, be able to work in one of those buildings. And what often comes up is that, is that we see imagery of these amazing timber buildings um, and often they're low rise buildings or they're three and four story buildings um, and they may be in a completely different country. And when an architect says, you know, I want one of these, um, but I want it to be 10 stories tall and I want to sit on that side over there, often it's very difficult because this building potentially was built, you know, without any issues of neighbouring buildings. It may have been built with no fire ratings at all. Um, it may have been built in a code environment which allowed timber to be completely exposed. And then you're putting that into a situation where it's suddenly a high-rise building. It needs potentially 120-minute fire rating. Um, the code may not even allow timber to be built. So there is, you know, a, a real difference between what's permitted for a low and a medium rise building and a high rise building. And I think importantly, this is, you know, pretty critical for mass timber because mass timber is the structure. So everything we typically do about mass timber is all about the building structure, the beams, the columns, the floors, the, the low bearing walls, all of those elements which build up what the, what the structure needs to do. And so when it comes to low and medium rise buildings, you know, we have a lot of freedom in some ways with those. Um, we, we can do a lot of things with them. And that's because you know, they're fast evacuation. Firefighters can get in there and 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 fire to fighting typically fight the fire typically externally. And codes kind of allow them to 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 fail in some ways. We have, you know, most building codes allow low and medium rise buildings to to if everything goes wrong, fire, you know, fire brigade, fire department don't turn up, that structure can collapse because of the fire and that is potentially an okay outcome very different to what happens for high-rise buildings you know significantly higher standard of fire safety um, and rightly so and as part of that we need to 
design the structure to withstand the full duration of a fully developed fire. So it's a very different design context from the point of view of how we design that timber column or that timber beam. Um, and I think it's important that we set that as the, the basis for all this work going forward and this that I want to present in this presentation because we're talking about high-rise buildings we're, we're having them set to a very high standard um, and it's a different standard to low and medium rise buildings and and you know I want to continue to sort of go back to that because it drives how we design and how we carry out the research that we need to be able to to um, complete to be able to get these buildings you know constructed so you know for low and medium rise buildings I think from a my point of view from a fire safety point of view I'm pretty comfortable that you know we should have codes which provide architects and engineers and um, everybody in the design community the ability to be able to to specify you know design approve specify get approved and and then get one built um, relatively easily and quickly um, because that's where the majority of the buildings are and we need to be able to have more mass timber buildings constructed by allowing this to occur. So, you know, code changes which encourage mass timber buildings, guidance to practitioners which encourages mass timber buildings, standards, regulations which allow that to occur, are, from my point of view, are all very important and should be encouraged. And I think from that point of view, you know, we're designing them to a standard fire, um, the fire ratings that they need, 30, 60, maybe 90 minutes, depending on the use and the height. Um, you know, potentially sprinkler protected, maybe not, depending on the, the situation, the, the country and whether it's residential or maybe it's, you know, office as to whether it needs sprinkler protection. But from my point of view, you know, a building which is five story, five stories, 60 minute rated, has sprinkler protection, all the timber is exposed, I think is a pretty reasonable solution. You know, we have probably have, have definitely from my point of view, would have, you know, two exit stairs, have some other fire protection measures in there. And I think that is a you know very relatively safe building compared to comparable steel or concrete building at the same height and area in use. And I'm you know very comfortable that we would have those sort of buildings constructed. And I think, as I said, we need to have trade organizations and writing guides which allow um, architects and engineers to be able to design those quickly and you know get them get them built as well and in a very efficient way. And so I think you know all codes need to be updated to allow that to occur. And we all play a part in trying to make sure there's enough research out there, enough solutions that allow you know the code writers as such, um, whether that's government or private, to be able to get um, the buildings constructed in that manner. And so the sort of buildings that we see um, in these low and medium rise structures, and I just want to provide some some good examples. You know, the the, the Cree, the life cycle tower. Um, you know, Cree have done a lot of sort of these hybrid structures, and in some ways, so I think have been um, you know quite revolutionary in the way they've continued to to have a hybrid um, sort of prefabricated mass timber um, structure, and I think that's it's it's a pretty clever one as well. But they they spent a lot of time on research to be able to come up with these sort of buildings. Um, and we see, you know, various different examples of, of these low and medium rise, um, you know, office and residential buildings that are being constructed in some ways globally. Um, and, you know, they're all somewhat different. They're all somewhat of an inspiration and, and meet, mean that other buildings get constructed because of them. Um, they have different forms, they have different uses, but, you know, there are general themes with these about having the exposed timber, having stories around sustainability. Um, and being, you know, relatively, you know, quite successful in their own um, sort of way, um, and you know, are, are certainly important to help change codes and help reinforce that code change that, that allow these types of building is really important. And I think, you know, there's some really cool, innovative, smaller buildings as well. Some of the, from my point of view, some of the most enjoyable timber projects are some of the quirky sort of smaller projects. And I think it's really important for us to continue to to want architects to innovate and owners to continue to innovate on timber buildings as well. And then there's the hard stuff, which is the high rise timber buildings, which is kind of what this presentation is, is more about. And I think, you know, this is where the challenges start to occur because, you know, where we have structural timber exposed and it's not fully encapsulated. So, and from my point of view, encapsulated means that it's not charring, you know, we've got non-combustible protection around it that prevents charring. Then, we have a very different problem from a fire point of view. We're assessing, you know, natural fires, physically based fires, depending on the terminology you want to use. Um, and we're addressing multiples of those based on different types of 
fire events. And, um, you know, part of the real challenge is us being able to, as, as designers and engineers and researchers and, and the whole community involved with this, is to be able to actually work out what those design fires are. And one of the biggest challenges we face, and I'm going to talk a lot more about this, is how we actually work out what those design fires actually will be in a high rise structure where we have exposed timber. Um, and that continues to be a problem because it, it relates to um, you know, the type of timber, the location of that, the ventilation we, we include. And the, the key third part is, is that, you know, that the exposed timber is changing the fire. So with non-combustible structures, the fire in some ways is the fire and the ventilation and the fuel results in a fire and that impacts on the structure. Um, where we've got timber, we're having the same situation. We've got fire, we've got ventilation. Um, but the, once the timber starts to become ignite, ignited, that's changing the actual fire. And so that feedback of where the fire and the, and the actual structure are interacting with each other is very different and creates a whole level of complexity that I think as a design community, um, and it's a very small one that's looking at this and being involved in it from a, a research and engineering point of view, and it is very, very small, it, it is something which we continue to be um, wanting to, to advance and continue to want to um, get to the end of, um, but knowing the fact that it is a very complex um, design problem as well. Um, and so when it comes to high rise buildings, you know, there are a number of these and there's some, been some very successful ones. Um, some of these early sort of CLT based structures, which, you know, garnered a lot of press and, for, and coverage as such and, and became in some ways sort of the pinups for um, the architectural community on mass timber. And I think these have been, you know, really informative in us understanding um, what works, not just from a fire point of view, but also you know, structurally from a vibration point of view, differential settlement, movement. Um, moisture control, you name it, um, acoustics, these have all been great learning examples. Um, and, you know, primarily have been, you know, UK, Europe, Canada, um, has been the main focus of, of, of taller buildings and, and more recently started to um, be sort of be pushed into the US as well, which I think has been quite a step change. And, you know, as you see with these, most of these are residential buildings, which have been primarily the, the taller buildings, you know, very significant differences in the way these buildings have been um, designed, engineered and approved with the outcomes. Um, and, you know, I suppose, a, you know, a great example would be, you know, Brock Commons, which has got all the timber um, encapsulated with um, fire out of gypsum board, but obviously fully sprinkled building, um, compared to, you know, maybe other buildings more recently, which have got the timber exposed or partly exposed and, um, you know, very significant differences in the way that the approvals have, have impacted and what the codes allow for those sort of buildings. So, you know, we continue to see changes with the way that, that timber is being used um, for high rise buildings. And, you know, even some of the, the in some ways, when we're talking high rise buildings, of course, we're still talking relatively low high rise buildings, you know, we're still talking in the low 20 stories and often some of these the majority of them are sort of in that 12 to 15 story range so um, from our point of view high rise is anything really which is sort of in that you know 10 to 25 story range and for you know when you talk to steel and concrete that's that's still a very small building from their point of view but you know these are still you know significant challenges um, and you know tallest at the moment and will be the tallest I speak for hopefully a few years at least until the next large building comes along, there's a St. Tower in Milwaukee, and this is a very nice sunny day a couple of weeks back, um, just from the um, the, um, the webcam, which um, so I can, people like myself can follow the construction, um, which is, you know, a fantastic residential building um, and has topped out already structurally, will be starting to be finished and will be um, completed in August and September, August or September, um, and, you know, has got, got us to the point where we do have a number now of buildings which are in that 20 to 25 story range for mass timber and which is you know really excellent and really positive to see where we've got to that point um, but again as I said number of significant challenges with those and we're talking a very small handful of buildings which we would consider to be you know truly high-rise buildings so you know what are the issues with these and what are the, the things that I think that we need to sort of concentrate on and move forward with and, and you know these are just some ways, my ideas and my thoughts, and um, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about these. I spend a lot of time looking at mass timber and talking with a lot of people. Um, and I think, you know, one of the key things, as I said earlier, is this issues of um, larger compartments. Um, and this, this, um, just grab the pointer. Um, 
this, you know, this diagram, some of you may have seen before, and I think it's one of the best ways that I think we've managed to um, describe exactly what the problem is and the fact that um, this is simply floor area versus in some way surface area and a, a comparison. And this is all the, 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 you know, the current sort of fire testing or fire experiments that we're doing um, on smaller scale rooms. So these are all, um, you know, smaller residential type um, size spaces where we're um, burning mass timber. Um, when we look at these these um, triangles are the non-combustible compartments where we've done, you know, larger scale experiments. And so these are all relatively small, you know, the largest um, non-combustible experiment is 350 square meters. Um, and of course, that's very different to what we're building, which is, you know, these here buildings with significant floor areas um, and building them as high rise buildings as well. well obviously quite large floor areas as well. And we're all very aware of the fact that we have continued to build very large buildings. But of course, the fire behavior in smaller compartments being very flash over dominant is, is very different to what we expect for larger floor areas where we've always looked at traveling fires. Um, and the, the difference, of course, is the fact that when we have timber ex exposed and in these large compartments, you know, what is the behavior that's occurring? What is actually going to occur in these spaces? Can we um, assume the same sort of classical fire sort of behavior with regard to flashovers or traveling fires? And that has been a question which I think has bothered quite a number of people for a number of years. And we're still starting to try and work through that to understand what that difference is. Um, and I think it's really important for us to, to do so because the design community from an architectural and owner point of view wants to build these and they want to build very tall versions of very large floor um, plate buildings. Um, and we've got a whole lot of data and information for smaller spaces that look like this. And we've got to make this transition. And I think this transition can be done in, from a non-combustible building relatively confidently because we know how the fire works and behaves in those spaces and how it interacts with the structure. Um, the difference is, of course, with timber is the fact that the fire and the structure are interacting. Um, so it's a very different sort of equation and a very different sort of process. And that's where we've got to be very cautious about it. And we've got to understand, um, you know, a lot more carefully about what it is that we're actually assessing. So, you know, from my point of view, what, what the research has shown to date is that we've had all of these sort of larger um, room scale type experiments. And, and again, it's the, the whole context of, you know, the relative scale of and, and the language being used because we call them small scale or we call them room scale or we call them large, large scale relative, you know, realistically, these are spaces which are room size or up to a small residential unit, you know, up to sort of 90 square meters. Most of them are 40, 50 sort of square meters. Um, so they're quite small. Um, they're reflective of a very small studio unit or up to a, sort of a one bedroom unit. And we've had lots of these with um, various areas of mass timber exposed, mostly CLT, some glue lam, um, some of them being fully encapsulated as baseline experiments. And there's been a significant number of these. And I think that's really important to understand is there has been a significant number of these over the last sort of seven or eight years. And rapidly we've built up this number. And, what we've seen is, is flashover behavior. Uh, we've seen that the, the, the location, the type of timber really does matter. Um, it can have a significant influence on the outcome. Um, it, it's also really important to understand that in some, some ways the growth and full development stage is kind of interesting, but isn't the most important part, that the, the decay of the fire is the most important part in from a um, timber point of view, which is different to steel and in some ways different to concrete, um, where peak temperatures and often all fire duration is more important. In this case, fire decay is actually quite important. Um, the, the, if we are going to protect the timber and stop it being um, impacted by the fire, then reliable en encapsulation really does matter um, because it has to be very much a binary approach. It's either encapsulated or it isn't. Um, and partial protection just doesn't really work. If it's got partial protection, really, you've probably got exposed timber. Um, and out of this has been some you know, fantastic amount of data research and some really, really fundamental outcomes, which I think have been, have really shaped the way that we have understood mass timber buildings um, and can start to take them from low and medium rise to, to high rise and start to understand how we can build with these. And so, you know, these large scale experiments have been 
um, you know, really, really important. And this is sort of a, a quick brief list of, of, uh, of the, these larger scale um, compartment experiments. And I think, you know, importantly, if you want to be involved in mass timber or you are involved in mass timber and the fire safety, you know, from my point of view, the, the published papers, the research reports, the websites which um, are related to these are fundamental reading and everybody needs to have understood these and read these and some, sometimes read them multiple times to be able to understand what has come out of those, what are the objectives, um, why there was particular tests carried out and you know why they were important from the point of view of, of their outcomes. Um, and it's been interesting sometimes, you know, I, I get to, to review um, works by other engineers sometimes who are looking at mass timber and I typically, you know, go through the first few pages, read the introduction and then flick to the sort of references and understand that if, and if these aren't listed or some of these aren't listed in the references, then I really have a concern because if you're looking at a building and you're looking at exposed mass timber and you're coming up with design fires, then unless you've understood how these sort of experiments have um, influenced the outcomes from a design fire point of view, then really you're kind of doing it in the dark um, and you're not using the most available and relevant information. And you know, some of these I think are really, really important. I want to just sort of, in some ways, just provide a little bit more information on some of these. And I've picked out a few which I've I've found really, I think, important. Um, I think you know some of the early work that was done at um, Carleton University in um, in Canada, um, I think, was really important in showing the impact of CLT delamination and um, understand. I think th those early ex experiments which were done, sort of 2012, 20, 2013. Um, from my point of view, were kind of fundamental in me understanding that mass timber um, wasn't as predictable as I thought it was from a compartment point of view. And I think that was a real sort of game changer for me. And I can remember um, being at a conference actually in Korea where we were talking about mass timber and there was a few of us presenting on mass timber and we actually sat aside and, and had a conversation and, and we talked about these experiments and um, they were just being carried out and they weren't even published. And I was having a look through some of the information and was just Sort of blown away by the fact that what I thought and thought I knew understood about compartment fire dynamics with exposed mass timber um, was completely changed by the fact that this material in CLT wasn't behaving as predictably as I thought. Um, and so I think from my point of view and from a number of other researchers who were involved in this, it was quite significant. I think, you know, the work that then NRC Canada have carried out and with that FP Innovations, who I probably should have written up here as well, uh, and the investment that has gone on in Canada and changing the way that um, mass timber is looked at from the, the point of view of what they're testing on now laminated timber and shafts and CLT connections, you name it, there's, there's research papers that they've looked at. It's been really fundamental. And I think um, with that, you know, people like Joseph Sue and his work in looking at um, non-delaminating CLT and, and and the impact of decaying fires was really important as well. So I think some of the NRC Canada work is really, really fundamental for, for understanding that behaviour and then starting to work out how to change that. Um, along with that is um, the Fire Protection Research Foundation testing, which was carried out at NIST, um, and again, had delaminating CLT and then seeing the impact of that delamination um, and then understanding you know, if we were designing taller buildings, how do we control that and how do we work out how to make sure that we don't have this unpredictable outcome? And again, you know, in some ways feeding back into the NRC work that Joseph Sue left, I think was really important in showing that if, if you change the adhesives and have um, different types of CLT, you can actually get a predictable outcome. And, and that was something which was controllable, was really, really important. Um, the, the work at Delphi University, um, Roy Crelard's work, I think was really important. And if you want to look at um, decay in fires and smoldering and sort of this issue of how the fires decay um, to the point of um, where they're, they're no longer sort of relevant, I think his work was really, really important in doing that. And um, he was um, really somewhat produced a lot of information on the decaying part of the fire. And I think that that is still stead in some ways the, the, the test of time as well. Um, and in some ways I haven't got um, Alistair Bartlett's work um, copied up in here, but I think his work as well, which sits just above that, the University of Edinburgh work um, was really important in, in determining that as well. Um, the ICC tests um, carried out in the US, um, important from the point of view of changing codes um, and showing that there was ways to be able to design buildings to ensure that 
um, you could get outcomes you wanted. And I think also the process that was gone through that where um, we, the task force involved looked at predicting the fires beforehand, carried out the fires, and then, you know, we then tried to work out where we're getting the right information out of those. And I think they were really informative tests from a um, from the point of view of changing codes and and kind of showing that you that there was a process whereby um, there was a reasonable way to be able to try and get the right information um, to be able to solve certain types of um, problems in a way which um, was important from a code perspective. Um, and I think that continues to be a, a reasonable way to be able to look at how we do change codes um, without stretching um, the information further than it should be. I, I, you know, the Epanon fire test, um, which was a large consortium of um, different groups, I think was um, pretty significant in what they set out to achieve. Um, looking at standard fire tests um, and comparing, you know, a furnace to actually a natural fire, physically based fire, and also looking at doing basic things with changing the ventilation, I think was really important as well. And also, you know, setting up a website, having all the information freely available. Um, and, you know, the published papers on that have also most of those are um, able to be downloaded as well. And I think that's really important in the fact that the information is available and it's really good fundamental findings. And also having decay phases as well and long decay phases, um, I think was you know incredibly important. So, you know, there has, I probably went on too long on this part, but I think it's really important from my point of view that if you are interested in understanding mass timber and understanding the importance of natural fires and how we've designed for those in tall buildings, you've got to understand some of this research that is out there and, um, you know, the work that's recently been um, conducted um, in Sweden by RISE and the work that Arabs involved with at Cerebin Imperial College and the recent um, fires that occurred a couple of weeks back with um, this Canadian Wood Council consortium, you know, we again continue to, to feed, you know, pretty important information into this. And so what do we get out of this? Well, I think, you know, there's been various view, um, variations of this sort of um, diagram, which I think is, is is pretty important. This is a, a plot um, of, you know, typical classical fire fire theory of fuel controlled and ventilation controlled um, type fires. And there's various um, little marks on here from um, a lot of these um, fires, fire experiments. Just And, you know, importantly of this is, is that, you know, what we're seeing is the fact that we are not seeing significant changes from the, what we would consider to be sort of classical fire theory when we have a lot of exposed timber but we are seeing changes and um i've tried to explain this a few times so i think the best way i explained it probably in a simple way was the fact that if you if you grow up driving on the left hand side of the road and you know how to drive down a road um if you then change and go to a country where you drive on the right hand side of the road you can still drive um, but everything is a bit different um and everything takes a bit longer and everything is just a little bit more complicated. And I think when it comes to mass timber, we're in that situation. All these classical ways of us calculating how to do fires, how to look at fire spread, how to look at how things will actually change um, when it comes to um, fire growth and the way that the fires will change, I think will probably stand up, but they're all going to be slightly different. And we've got to look at how those change and we've got to look at reevaluating all of those. Um, and I think that continues to occur, and that's what we're doing. We've, we've got a really good base. We've got to look at how we alter all these different methods to be able to change and come up with accurate predictions to be able to model external flames, to be able to model traveling fires, to be able to model um, you know, heat flux of a compartment, and all those sort of continual different um, things that we need to do from an engineering point of view. So, you know, we will continue to do that. Um, but I think we've got to make sure that we understand the data and we've got to keep collecting that data to be able to do that. So what are we missing? Um, and I think some of the important things we are missing here, I want to get into a, a little bit more detail. Um, and there's uh, some of my thoughts, you know, I spend a lot of time, um, I feel like I'm kind of in this image here, I'm continuing looking down a path of um, a lot of timber columns and a lot of timber beams trying to work out what's going on and having discussions with a lot of different people about what we are missing and what we need to be able to do. And, um, you know, this is sort of a, a, just a short list of, I think, areas where we do need more work. Um, and some of these we are starting to solve now. Some of these we probably haven't looked at and some of these we need to spend a lot more time on. Um, and we can design buildings 
um, at the moment, but we've got to design them very, very conservatively. And the problem is when we design very, very conservatively, we add cost. Um, and potentially that's the difference between a building going ahead and not going ahead, because in the end, someone has to pay for all this additional cost that we are designing in by being conservative. Um, and we've got to be conservative and reasonably conservative. We don't have the data and the facts available to us. Um, and we've also got to understand how some of these behaviours impact the way we design as well and potentially designing in additional um, fire protection matters or additional methods or, or ways to be able to mitigate these as well. So we've got to have a good understanding to be able to design tall buildings. So I've called these areas for future work. I think they are um, areas probably for future research as well. And some of them are areas for ongoing um, research as well, because we're doing some of this at the moment, but we need to do a lot more. Um, I've talked about this a little bit, um, glue line integrity in um, CLT, and um, these are three photos which I took. Um, this is at NIST as part of the Fire Protection Research Foundation test, and you know this is one of the first tests we had to expose CLT wall, and as you can see, it's an hour and 57. We pretty much in a separate room watching this by um, video feed. Um, the fire had completely died down. We all kind of came out and we were kind of discussing does the fire get put out? How long do we leave it before we just, you know, put some water on it and let it die? You know, maybe another 20 minutes. It's it's pretty much dying off. And then, as you can see, within 14, 15 minutes, the fire had grown completely back up. Within 20 minutes, we had all needed to go back into um, a separate room and stand well back because of the, the fire had completely reflashed over. Um, and that's purely because of um, the, the delaminating, the, the lack of the delaminating behavior of the CLT, the lack of um, glue line integrity. And it's important. And I think it's, it's an important aspect when it comes to high rise buildings, because we need to be able to have reliable decay. And if we're in a situation where a fire has decayed um, such that it's burnt through and we're, you know, close to two hours after the, the peak has been reached and we're then getting a second peak, then that is a significant problem. Um, from an engineering point of view, but also obviously a significant problem from a firefighting point of view. Um, and, you know, not everybody has seen the lamination occur. And this is some image on the left. Again, I've, I've videoed this of, you know, chunks of CLT coming off a ceiling. In this case, we've got exposed CLT on a wall and the ceiling and, and it's small pieces, it's larger pieces. Um, and this is what happens as part of the CLT delamination. Um, and, you know, we know about it. We know it's adhesive dependent. We know what the issues are with it. And we know that we can design around it if we want to. And from my point of view, when it comes to high rise buildings or other buildings where I've got a choice to be able to specify CLT, I'm going to specify one which um, I can ensure has a reliable um, decay from a fire point of view, because I think if we're not, then it's, it's an added risk that we're adding into a project. And, and I think if we're not designing for it, then we've got to be able to, to make sure that we understand um, how we control that. And the only way that I see about to control it is, is either we encapsulate it all, or if we expose it, then we've got to make sure that it doesn't occur. So I think the key thing here, though, is, you know, how do we prove group blue line integrity? Um, and this is, a, is something which I think a lot of um, researchers are still grappling with. Um, Forest Products Laboratory in the US, um, Sam Zelenka looked at a, a small scale methodology with tension tests. And I think there's a, some real um, benefit in that. We've looked at smaller scale tests and looking at char rates. Um, that's certainly another method, again, probably slightly inaccurate. Um, ETH, the, you know, the team at ETH have, have, and others have looked at mass loss and actually measuring, um, just measuring the mass loss over a certain set period of time. And I think that was, and probably is a very good method as well, but we still need to work on that to, to determine how best can we accurately predict the glue line integrity, especially where we've got thinner lamellas um, and CLT where we've got, you know, different adhesives as, as adhesives change and continue to change with the evolving industry. Um, as far as natural fires, we, as I said, we've I've talked on this a little bit, I suppose we this is a very current and complex issue. And I think we need to be able to understand how we design um, and have correlations that from an engineering point of view, we can design with to determine what the natural fire is. And that's the growth, the full development and the decay and to be able to get that relatively accurate. Um, the fuel load's important with this. The ventilation is incredibly important with this. And then we've got to be able to determine, of course, that aspect of the feedback from a structural timber point of view and whether the timber is exposed on the wall or, or the ceiling or whether it's partially um, 
you know, partly protected or, or partly exposed is going to be really, really important. Um, you know, the work that Daniel Brandon has done has been um, incredible. He's done an, you know, an enormous amount of work on that and probably his, you know, part-time hobby is, is continuing trying to update his predictive model. He's on holidays in Rockies at the moment. I expect he's probably still, you know, bothering himself trying to think about ways to improve his model. And his is, you know, definitely the best model out there at the moment. Um, the work that Colleen Wade has done in predictive modeling with exposed timber has also been, you know, really, really excellent. Looking at it slightly differently as well and trying to feed in more about how much fuel is exposed um, sorry, how much fuel is is burnt inside the compartment or is left, um, you know, un, unburned outside the compartment, which is a really important factor as well. And again, this comes back to this ventilation aspect. Um, but, you know, this is where we need to spend a lot more work from my point of view. Um, the work that Arab and Cerebra and Imperial are doing, are looking at this and, and the work that Imperial um, College London will be doing is, I think, really important. Um, from the point of view of taking the data from the, the you know the large compartment tests that we've carried out, and this is an image from those, and I think it's one of the most fascinating images that I that came out of all these. Um, and what we're looking at here is basically you know the fire plume. We've got ignition. We've got you know a few minutes of burning, and you've got a the ignition of an exposed CLT surface, and this is you know burning and burning you know relatively well, and this you know burning is projecting twenty or thirty meters down. The actual CLT um, exposed CLT ceiling, um, and on the floor we've still got the wood crib which is not ignited. So when it comes to travelling fires, our philosophy is that the, the travelling fire occurs along the floor, and then we get you know it impacts on the structure. And I think we've got to recognise with exposed CLT that we're getting fire spread as a travelling fire along the ceiling, um, and then we're getting the exposure into the floor, which is setting the fuel on fire on the floor. So it's a very different type of traveling fire and a very different type of fire exposure as well. So, you know, very complex problem. Um, from a research point of view, absolutely where we need to be spending more time on and understanding from the current um, research we have and then, you know, what are, the, what are the gaps and being able to start to fill those with you know, master's projects and PhD projects to be able to try and work out and fill in all these gaps and try and join up all the pieces on this. Um, something that I'm interested in um, and spend a lot of time looking at um, myself is this issue of, um, you know, measuring char depth and understanding where the char actually stops when it comes to timber structures. Um, I find this particularly interesting because um, I've always been interested in the aspect of, you um, the, the thermal penetration behind the char, so this this layer behind the char and how deep that goes and what impact it has, because it it does matter and it matters over duration of the fire exposure as well. Um, and importantly, I think the more data we're seeing and the more we're looking back into things, we start to see that you know there is a residual heat wave that occurs into timber, um, which is important, but also the delay in the heat wave as well and the fact that. If we have a peak compartment temperature, we're not getting the peak and the temperature uh, te peak temperature into the timber um, until after that. So, you know, what occurs as far as a peak temperature in the compartment doesn't reflect into the strength of the timber because um, as the thermal wave and the thermal um, temp you know waves and the temperatures start to um, work into the timber, they're degrading the timber and they're degrading the strength of the timber. Um, and it's something we need to account for. Um, we can work on it with, you know, in some ways, fairly simple sort of heat transfer modeling, um, and we can accurately predict it. But first of all, we have to understand that it is a problem. We need to understand that delay um, in the fact that we're looking at temperatures after the peak in the compartment. And we also need to understand that we may have a compartment which is at 100 degrees Celsius, but there is still timber which is sitting here behind the char, which is at two or 300 degrees, and it's still penetrating into the timber and degrading the strength. So, you know, this is a particular issue which I think is relevant for tall buildings. Um, for the work we did in, on at Ascent, I looked into this. Um, we found that from, a, you know, looking at the CLT floors, it wasn't really an issue because floors aren't typically designed for, for fire, you know, they're designed for vibration and strength. And so you've got a lot more capacity from a fire point of view. Um, we looked at this for the beams, um, found that maybe about a quarter of the beams needed to be slightly upgraded to, to account for the, this delay in temperature. Um, but for all the exposed columns, I think 90% of the exposed columns, we needed to upsize them to assess, um, once we'd assess the, the impact of um, the, the 
thermal penetration that would occur and the thermal wave that would occur in degrading the strength of the timber. So it is very significant and it is really important. Um, again, one of those items we can assess, we can detail it. We do it very conservatively because that's the only way we know at the moment and we need to spend more time looking at this to be able to understand how to do that in a probably more accurate way um, and again, to make sure that we're not over designing. Um, and, but you know, that's in some ways what we need to do until we have the right information and research. Exterior um, flaming, I think is relevant, you know, is really important. We've, and I think more um, testing is needed and more experiments are needed. Um, the work again, Arab and Cerebin Imperial have done, have looked at external flaming. There was, you know, it's been a significant amount of work um, with the, the um, RISE tests and the whole, separate study on facades and external exterior flaming, ex external flaming, which has been really important. And I think as part of this, the question is, if we are having a lot of exposed timber, um, how, how long are the flames extending above what would be normal? And then what are those temperatures? And does that mean we potentially get fire spread over sort of one or two floors? And then how do we mitigate that? And I think we're sort of comfortable the fact that we we and I think we've always known we probably are going to get slightly longer flames and the question is then is it an issue um and you know then the question is how much of an issue is and what do we do to to, to sort of mitigate that from the point of view that do we need to understand that potentially firefighting water needs to be increased to allow for the fact that we may end up having two floors burning at once instead of one um simply because we have this extended flame and and we may get um, fire spread slightly quicker don't know we've got to understand that again you can we can be conservative in our design but we've also got to be realistic about um, where those risks are and what what the issues are and also the fact is is that um, you know even with non-combustible buildings we can still get you know, very long flame extension so we've got to be realistic about it in some ways not penalize timber buildings um, just because there has been some really good research done on this but from a non-combustible building point of view, not combustible structures, maybe there, there just hasn't been the more recent research to be able to, to, to back up um, those differences. So, and I think importantly with this as well, exterior, you know, firewall tests, um, you know, I think we all recognize that maybe they aren't as relevant to what is being built as they should be. And um, again, the RISE work and that I think will be pretty fundamental in looking at a more European um, test. Just a couple more to finish off, um, you know, connections, I think, are really important. And I think, you know, there's a couple of things here where, you know, the, the, from a research point of view, we're probably not fire um, testing the connections that the industry are using. Um, and that's always difficult because a lot of those are often proprietary in nature. Um, and often where there is testing off its intention, whereas, you know, typical connections of, like this are in shear and in bending. And so we've got to have um, a, a good understanding of are we testing them in the in the right way as well? Um, it is, you know, very complex thermomechanical problem, very hard to model um, because we can model the temperatures, but it's very hard to to model the deformation that occurs, the rotation that occurs in the timber. Um, you know, we've got steel, we've got steel connectors, we've got steel screws. We may have aluminium connectors and steel screws, and then we've obviously they're all connected to timber. So it's you know it's a complex interaction with those. So we have solutions that they are very conservative. Um, and we do need to do more on this. And I think importantly as well, we need to understand that if we have a connection which is um, exposed to a standard fire and, and is loaded and behaves in a certain way, does that still work under a natural fire? And I think there is some evidence to say, yeah, it probably does, but it would be nice to have a lot more on that because it would be you know, useful for us to understand where those potential gaps are and then you know, how do we just mitigate that a little bit more. And smoldering, I think, is a really interesting topic. Um, I think, you know, we more and more we're being aware that this will occur um, in the in the later decay phases of a fire where um, the, the fire department aren't um, as actively involved as they would like to be from the point of view of um, putting water on the fire. So we've got to be able to determine how best to sort that out. Um, you know, it's all about detection of the smoldering. It's all about understanding where it is. You know, you don't need an enormous amount of water to put out the smoldering. It's just a matter of determining exactly where that is. And then the question is, you know, do fire departments have the right equipment at the moment? Does their, you know, standard sort of infrared or heat, heat sort of thermal imaging cameras work well enough or do they need specialized equipment? Um, and then, you know, how do you best go about um, providing the right tools to be able to ensure that the smoldering is being um, dealt with? And, Prior to that as well, are we designing buildings 
And can we design buildings to make sure we don't get smoldering? I think that's another part as well. You know, how do we deal with those interfaces, timber to timber joints and, and design those to, to potentially try and uh, prevent some of the smoldering occurring or, you know, minim minimizing the spread of it. Um, and there's a lot of other items which I haven't covered um, and some of them are listed here and there's, you know, we've, we are just running a list of sort of research topics and product tests which need to occur and, you know, I could probably list out another 20 or 30 which we could cover here of where we need more research and a lot of this research is often about how do we improve on what we've got, you know, how do we make sure that what we've got we've got more of and more solutions or how do we make sure that what we're designing isn't being highly conservative because it doesn't make a lot of sense to be able to do that or can we improve what we're doing like you know encapsulation solutions do we have some really you know good low carbon performing materials which can carry out you know the same or better performance than sort of a fire rated plaster board and is there a better solution for that and potentially it's more expensive but for some clients they'd be willing to put the money in to be able to get that so we've got to be able to give them those opportunities and choices and um, you know there's lots of detailing things as well you know I think importantly you know the difference and you know how do we design around you know this is you know fire rated plaster board which is butting up against you know fire rated Timber as such, this is as a rating, obviously this has a rating and this has a rating and how do we ensure that that rating is continuous around those elements? And, and that is a good question because we often don't have the solutions for those and we, we can design them and we can detail some of those, but we're generally doing it in a fairly conservative way as well. So there's a lot of detailing aspects where there could be a lot of smaller projects, which I think could be really important to help inform us as engineers um, and architects and designers to be able to come up with better solutions. So just um, finally, um, you know, I think with these, you know, when it comes to mass timber, as I've said, you know, we all need to design more sustainable buildings. And I think that's one of the most important things we need to be doing. Um, mass timber is a great way to be able to do that. And we need to be able to ensure that we have better um, low and medium rise accessibility to timber buildings. And again, this needs, you know, published research, which codes, um, code committees, standards committees um, can actually, you know, include and, 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 and um, you know, make sure that those changes occur. It's very different for high rise buildings. Um, we still need a lot of research in those. Um, we need to be able to make sure we're understanding the, the challenges, understanding the gaps and being able to, to fill those. And that's where um, continual research needs to occur. Um, you know, this is a video of um, a recent NFPA 285 test of a CLT exterior wall. So, you know, this is... Um, mineral on the outside and there's a there's CLT sitting on the back there and it's one of the first successful you know CLT exterior walls that's that's passed a standard fire test so we can do these and we can make sure that these happen we just got to make sure that we do it in a way which allows um, them to be used in the right way and hopefully influences code changes and standards change as well and as I said we need to do this based on you know the right facts and data and that's where the research community certainly plays a significant role in that. So thank you very much. Um, happy to take comments and questions and um, hopefully answer whatever I can. And if not, then um, hopefully potentially um, at least start some form of debate as well. So um, thank you for joining and um, I'll hand it back over to Stavros to, to, um, to carry on. Thanks very much. Are you there, Stavros? If you are, we can't hear you. Uh, okay, thanks, Dave. Thanks for the brilliant presentation. I, I yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Uh, where's uh, Stavros, but we can proceed to the q and if you okay. want. I already seen a lot of questions over the screen. Uh, you want to go of them by, by yourself or? Yeah, I'm happy to just jump in and yeah, start yeah, to, to work through those. Yeah. Um, shall I share my screen so that someone can, so people can see those questions? What's the best way to do that? Or should I just read them out? Uh, I, I think I think it's a good idea because I think the first question from Nick Chen uh, 
said notice some of the photos showing the entire facade being clouded with timber yes yes yeah um so I, I think there's a couple of things in this one firstly um some of the buildings um i suppose there's a few parts of this. one there are some buildings which are low rise um and in some countries you can have you know timber up to a certain height and it's perfectly reasonable to do so and that changes country by country um there are some buildings which where the where the facades look like timber it is not timber it is a non-combustible material um and um you know architects love that because um, you can't really tell um that it's not timber at all and then there are some buildings where they do have timber and the timber is you know to quite a height um personally i'm not a fan of it i don't think we should have timber on the exterior of buildings i think it's fine for you know three four story buildings i don't think that's too much of an issue because you five you know fire departments fire brigades can fight that externally i think over a height i think you know when it's it's a combustible material it's it will spread fire i mean at least we've got a good understanding of how fire will spread on timber but it definitely will spread i think the idea of impregnating it with fire retardants is potentially an option but you've got to be very careful of that because it you know it does weather and the question is then how you replace and maintain that timber um, and that fire retardant so personally i don't i i have a real problem with that um i think there's there's a some solutions for it i've carried out and looked at solutions for timber on facades i think you can do some of it i think there are solutions but i think we've got to be very very careful with it Oh, cool. thank, thanks, thanks for the answer. Um, uh, Stavros told me they experienced a little bit technical difficulty. So I think anyway, we're gonna continue the Q and A. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Should I just read out my next one? Um, I think um, the next one from Nick again. Um, yes. I wonder what is this design file you've chosen for the larger compartment you've worked on with fully exposed CLT. Um, how is design fire curve constructed and justified? Yeah, good question. Um, I think certainly for residential spaces, it is a lot easier because we've got a lot of, um, you know, natural physically based fires that have occurred in residential spaces. So um, there's been enough of those experiments that we've got some good data on those. Um, you know, the the US Forest Service ICC test um, was in a space which was, you know, one bedroom apartment. It was, you know, just on 90 square meters. So that's, you know, the ability, and we are I'm pretty comfortable we can scale that up to sort of 100, 120 square meters, which is, you know, would cover 90% of most residential apartments. So from my point of view, there's, there's a reasonable amount of data for us to, to be able to look at design fires and, and use predictive tools and be able to sort of verify those against um, the experimental data we've got. The problem comes for obviously larger spaces, um, compartment buildings, which are, you know, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 square meters. That's where it becomes a lot more difficult for us to, to be able to, um, use the tools we've got and um, to be able to to make those accurate and predictive decisions. Um, and from my point of view, it's a matter of using the tools and that and that we do have available. Um, and as I said, I think you know Daniel Brandon's research um, and the tools that he's made of you know the, the predictive method that he's made available has been very good. Um, Colleen Wade's published uh, method has been very good. And you know with an Arab we've worked for for a number of years at having a predictive tool um looking at um you know open larger compartment spaces and trying to uh, model those as well and, and can have continued to um, improve on that and we've got concerns about how far you take that i mean you know we can only verify that against you know fires which are in smaller spaces so i i think we've got to be careful about how much we scale that up and hence the reason why the larger scale tests that you know from from my point of view now firm Arab have invested in looking at a space which is you know 385 square meters and looking more of that sort of traveling fire behavior has been very important because what we want to be able to do is in the same way that we've used non-combustible compartments to scale those up to larger compartments we want to be able to do the same thing so um you know i from my point of view we i think we can potentially look at those very conservative 
conservatively maybe up to sort of 1500 square meters or so maybe 2000 but I, I think we need to do a lot more work on the on the sort of on the other side of understanding the verification of those and understanding um, the influences of ventilation um, and you know how the how the um, the differences in, in the resultant fire curves impact the structure especially in the decay phase and all of this realistically is about getting that decay phase correct in those in those design fires. Hi David sorry I dropped earlier um, we yeah. move to the next question from from Aiden. Um, yeah. Would you like to me to read it for you, or are you just gonna go? Uh, yeah. Well. Um, okay. Yeah, I can. <laughs> I can read it out. Um, so um, I'll just I'll just read it out right now. Um, when you expose mass timber, would you consider it critical that self extinction is achieved? Um, uh, first of all, my my theory on self extinction is first of all you got to define self extinction extinction. So before you even start with de determining what your designing too, you've got to define it. And so self-extinction can mean 10 different things to 10 different people. And I think that's one of the problems we have. So to me, self-extinction is where um, the fire no longer thermally impacts the timber. So your timber has reached a point where its thermal degradation has stopped. Um, there's no more char and there's no more thermal impact into the timber. Now that is very different as a, as a, as a definition from self-extinction to one which may be a lot more um, widely used, which is more about the flame ceasing on the on the actual timber. So self extinction has often been used um, describing when the flames actually stop on on the timber. Um, now, if you're using that one, then to me that's that's a real problem because you'll still get a lot of charring after the flames have stopped. Um, you know, you're still getting compartments where the temperatures are still potentially five or six hundred degrees, um, and there's still a lot of thermal um, degradation going on through charring and also through thermal penetration and in some of the experiments we've looked at you've actually got to the point of reaching um, the flame ceasing so-called you know potentially self-extinguishment self-extinction but the peak temperature in the timber hasn't even been reached so the temperatures are still going up inside the timber so uh, you know it's really important from that sort of aspect of you know, that aspect of understanding the difference between the compartment fire and what's happening in the timber, I think is really, really important. Um, the next part of that, understand that the adhesive is one element of the design which may form part of the structural fire engineering strategy. However, without self-extinguish extinction, the structure will continue to burn and all glues will fail at their respective critical temperature. Uh, yes, agree with that. Um, you mentioned Brandon's method as the most advanced at this time. However, the approach is reliant on delamination being avoided. Yep, it totally is all the methods for predicting um, natural fires within compartments do not include for delamination because you just can't, it's too hard to be able to include that. Um, but it's quite on providing any guidance on designing for self-extinction outside of using specific adhesives. Um, would you consider that this approach is only applicable for potentially low medium rise redesigning for self extinctions but perhaps not as critical as a consequence of failure is low um i think on that uh, to me i think again it comes back to potentially you can probably maybe different conversation but to to it depends on what your definition of self extinction is i expect um as to how best to answer that question but um I, to me from a um you know, for the predictive models, you cannot include delamination. Um, it's just no way to be able to include that. Um, and it's even if, uh, you know, I think if, even if we could understand that as the way it works, I think it would be too hard, you know, it's too much of a step to be able to actually include that in the models we've got now anyway. So it makes sense to not include that because, it, you know, we can't have a model. Um, we don't have the models correct at the moment. It's just, you know, that's, that's multiple degrees of complex, complexity, which we haven't got to as yet. So it makes sense to not include that. Um, and the models are very good in some ways at, at modeling decay. And I think um, that's important. And understanding the decay in the compartment fire, which is different to the decay in temperatures inside the timber. And I think that's one of the things which is important for everyone to sort of think about is that you've got to be able to model what occurs in your in your um, your compartment well, but you've also got to then model the impact of that inside 
the actual timber as well. And that's charring, but it's also that thermal penetration. So um, certainly you'll get some form of um, decay and, and you'll get to the point where all the fuel has burnt out um, and, and then you'll get this longer period of um, slower decay. And it's important for all of us to be able to ensure that we account for that and account for all of that in the charring. So hopefully that's answered that question. Right, we move to the next one from Nick. Yeah. Again. Um, from Neil, carbon capture concrete. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm not an expert on carbon capture concrete. I don't know what it is. Um, yeah. Um, I'm sure someone will tell us. Hopefully, it's not. Hopefully, it's not one of those things where um, certain industries um, give names to things like you know clean coal and clean steel and those sort of things. Um, but you know, let's wait and see. Um, question here from Kai. Um, in your opinion, is the fire safety of timber steel hybrid construction well studied? We've seen a few buildings with such elements such as uh, glue lamb steel column. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it is. I think it's a really good area for a, a lot of work. Um, I think um, the typical building maybe of a steel frame, you know, steel columns and beams of CLT floors. Um, certainly, we could do a lot more work on looking at the connection between the CLT and the steel beam. Um, I think there's a lot of work to do on that. It'll be, I don't think there's, you know, I think there potentially has been one standard test on that, and but it hasn't had any published information. So um, there certainly would, it would be definitely useful to have a look at that. Um, then there is, you know, we've got buildings with glue lamb columns and steel beams, um, exactly how they interact. Um, we're probably have some idea, but not completely. Buildings with concrete floors and blue lamb columns, um, there is various different hybrids. So um, I think all of those are worthy of more exploration and more research. Um, and um, a lot of those are really interesting topics, and especially that those sort of interfaces and junctions between steel and timber, and um, I think are really important because we are obviously importantly from my point of view is if we if we have give, you know if we've got a say a 120 minute rated building and we have a steel beam which has got a 120 minute rating um you know that is allowed to get to about 500 or 550 degrees celsius um and it would still be a passing rated system um you know whether it's got paint or steel or sorry painted steel um spray or board on it um but if you've got a, a steel element at sort of 500 degrees celsius it's connected direct to a timber element um, all that heat's been transferred into the timber element. And so the timber's exposed to the same fire, but it's heated from the outside. And then potentially if it's connected through a central knife plate or something like that, then it's being heated on the inside as well. So, you know, there's some, there's some more work to be done in that area. Um, and again, we can design for those, but we're designing it pretty, pretty conservatively as well. Uh, next question, oh, Brian Ash, lost. Thanks Brian for tuning in, very good view. Um, any views on the use of exposed surfaces in the very early stages of fire, is fire spread in the corridor? Yeah, I think um, I suppose purposely concentrate on the structural side of um, timber, but I think, you know, the early flammability is something which, um, you know, we're all aware of timber as a combustible material. Um, it's not as combustible as other materials that could be used in various different public spaces or corridors, but it certainly does need to be controlled. And from what I've seen, there is a, a quite a, wide um, range of acceptability on flammability um, for timber against with different codes in different countries. And um, it, it, I think, depends on whether you're a sprinkled space or a non-sprinkled space um, as to the impact of that. And I think when we look at the differences, um, certain countries have quite high um, classification, sorry, quite high requirements um, in their classification for timber and, you know, want timber to be, you know, painted or coated to reduce the flammability um, in the same building in a different country. Um, it can be completely, um, you know, completely just natural and won't need any treatment. And often a lot of that is related to the, does the building have sprinklers or not, which I think is, is probably pretty relevant. Um, but certainly I think we could have a better understanding of how um, timber does burn, partly driven by the fact that the way we're testing is typically either a room test um, or it's a, it's a you know it's a sort of e, sort of an ASTM E84 type test, which is a you know flat horizontal test, 
um, then often we're putting those same materials in different configurations. And I think the testing doesn't often reflect the way the materials are being used. So um, it concerns me where we test in a horizontal way and then we put timber on a vertical face and then we think we're gonna get obviously the same outcome. So yes, I think it is an issue. Um, and again, it would be um, useful to be able to understand that. Um, and we are probably over penalizing timber in some situations and probably potentially not doing enough in others. Uh, David, I think we skipped one question. Yeah, which one was that? Uh, that was from uh, Nick again, uh, about what codes and standards would you recommend? Uh, yes. Yep. Uh, would you recommend for designing high-rise timber buildings if the local code is super prescriptive and <laughs> prohibiting us, the designers, to design mass timber buildings? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I suppose interesting. There, I mean, there is a lot of guidance out there. Um, everything from, um, you know, specific kind of guides that are referenced by, by codes to um, industry type guides. Um, as far as the, probably the most comprehensive guide, I suppose, in some ways, I think the Canadian guide to, toward buildings is probably one of the best. Um, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's free and accessible to everybody. Um, I think that's one of the better guides. There's British Columbia, ver British Columbia version of that as well, which is slightly different. Um, but I think the Canadian guidance is probably the most comprehensive when looking at a whole a timber building as a whole from the point of view of um, the materials, egress, fire protection, and then getting into some of the other um, aspects of that as well. So um, I think as a framework, that is probably one of the better ways to be able to look at it. Um, and I think you know, it is, is probably not as well utilized as it probably could be. Um, and then obviously there are various different other standards which um, and, and guidance which can apply um, depending on um, you know, the country you're in and, and what is most applicable. I mean, obviously Eurocode 5 in the year 1995-1-2 um, is a standard which a lot of people refer to, but it's not a code. It, it, it simply um, you know, is referring to how we can assess timber um, when exposed to standard fires. Um, and it's useful for that, but there are lots of other, um, you know, obviously country-based standards which do similar sort of, um, you know, produce similar sort of results when it comes to assessing, you know, char rates for timber. And it's, it's I think, needs to be considered in that way and used, needs to be used in that way. Um, but it's not going to provide you with a comprehensive solution on how to design a you know, a 10 story timber building, that's not its job. You know, that's what realistically codes generally need to do. Um, I think the advances in um, the IBC, the International Building Code, which is the US model code um, over the last um, few years have been important. And I think, you know, where they're at for, um, you know, um, this is the 2021 version um, for 12 story and 18 story buildings, I think is, is um, is I think pretty reasonable um, and I think that would certainly be a place that uh, would certainly be a good place to start as well and again um, the National Building Code of Canada which um, is the, the most recent version of that um, allows buildings up to 12 stories as well so that could also be another um, guidance document that could allow you to to look at um, timber buildings. I think a lot of other countries look at it from the point of view of doing it in a performance-based way a lot of the um, when you look at a lot of the national codes in Europe, it's it's allowing timber up to a certain height, maybe that's four stories or six stories or eight stories. Um, and then after that, it's allowing a performance based option or it's saying from, you know, from the start that you can build in timber, but you've, you've got to do it as a performance based option. Um, and I think, you know, that's a different approach, of course, rather than having something which is slightly more prescriptive. So hopefully that helps. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I think the next question is uh, uh, from uh, Chris. Okay, what are your thoughts on the conservatism of applying Daniel Brandon's method for calculating the contribution of mass timber for compartments larger than 500 square meters? Yeah, uh, I, I think, I mean, I've had, a, you know, Daniel and I have had a number of discussions about this, you know, over a number of years. Um, and I, I think it's probably reasonable. I think it's totally, Credible and um, I, uh, you know, in some ways, I think it's all about accuracy. Um, and again, as I've, I suppose I've indicated, um, there is two parts of that: is getting the, the peak temperatures correct, because obviously that um, feeds back into calculating char rates. 
um, for those particular times that you have the peak temperatures, which, you know, depending on your ventilation could be a short time or it could be quite a reasonably long time. Um, and then the decay period and getting the decay period reasonably accurate, but also conservatively and, and not um, underestimating the length of decay. So um, I think it, it, you know, I'm supportive of, of, of the of the model, I'm supportive of the the, the work that's gone on in, in that, and I'm I'm supportive also of it being you know absolutely relatively um, conservative because it needs to be um, without additional data to keep feeding it and improve it. Um, and I think that's um, exactly how it should be, um, and it needs to be in that way because we are then you know using that output to then be able to determine um, you know how, how to design the structure um, and how how this feeds into the structural capacity for columns, beams, floors, and walls, and those sorts of things. So I think it does need to be, and that's partly driven by the fact that we are we've got you know data for compartments that are small, and we're um, making some assumptions on how far those sort of models can be taken um, based on um, you know fire behaviour, which is flashover type behaviour, and we've seen it in larger compartments. We still get that um, flashover behaviour. Um, but we're starting to make assumptions on that once we're sort of getting, I think, beyond sort of five, six, seven hundred square metres, we're still potentially assuming we're getting some form of flashover behaviour um, and getting all the fuel burning at once with the timber and the fuel. Um, but we're maybe, you know, obviously we're not 100 percent sure of that. So I think it's reasonable to be conservative on that. Jump to the next one. Um, it's yep. from Hayden. Um, the mass timber structures pose additional challenges with post fire repair and reoccupation. Would this be reliant on encapsulation? Um, I, I mean, I've, I've sort of gone. I suppose I've looked at this a number of times, and I think um, you know the, the situation is if we have a very large fire that affects the structure, then you know the, you have so much damage from the fire and the smoke itself, typically above the fire um, and the floors above it. Um, and you have so much damage because it is a large fire, it's affecting the structure from the water damage which goes downwards. So a, a building is significantly damaged and um, whether it's a residential building or office building, um, I think it comes back to you know, insurers have to insist it, decide how best to repair the building or whether the building could be repaired. Um, and I don't think that's reliant really on the structure. I think that's it's a separate issue. Um, and so I think it really comes back to smaller fires where you have a smaller fire and how does that affect the structure locally? Um, and, and, you know, with timber, we can diagnose the damage pretty quickly because, you know, if you know the original cross-section size, it's pretty easy to drill in and work out where the damage occurs um, and the depth of the damage. Um, and that's really easy to be able to do. And it's, you know, I've been involved in um, fire damage structures and the repair of those, and it is actually relatively easy to, to diagnose. It's different um, with concrete and steel. You've got to send it off the labs and work out what the damage is, and it's often quite harder to do. Um, but then the answer is, how do you repair it? And you can repair it. I mean, um, if you're not, if you, if you're repairing the timber which was already sacrificial, then you can actually, you know, put on sacrificial timber. And there's been some more work done on that more recently. Um, looking at different ways to be able to do that. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's possible. I think we've just got to understand the limitations of what we can repair and then um, how best to do that. Um, with encapsulation, certainly um, if it was encapsulated, I expect you'd have to replace all of that, of course. Um, but I think for smaller fires, yeah, I think there are just as many challenges as any other sort of fire when it comes to structure and, and the damages. And then, you know, there's bigger challenges like how do you, how do you replace a column 12 stories up in the building? Um, you know, those are pretty significant challenges, whatever you need to, whatever sort of material it is. So I hope that helps. Uh, next question from uh, Tristan, where can Brandon's tool be found? Um, you can um, probably, um, if you go to, I'm trying to think that there is a, on the RISE website, there's actually a dedicated page um, to, um, the work that's currently been done with um, timber buildings. Um, and it's ex I'm trying to think of the exact name and I can't quite remember it. Um, if you want to email me, I can send you a link to it. I can, I just can't remember the name offhand, but um, it's, it's around exposed timber um, and the use of exposed timber um, for, um, to, for, for um, buildings. Um, and so that's one part of one location. 
Um, there is earlier information which is available through the Fire Protection Research Foundation. If you if you Google the Fire Protection Research Foundation um, study on um, tall wood buildings, um, as part of the um, reporting on that, you can find some of the earlier versions on that. And then Dan has published on it as well. So you could probably look up some of his papers. Um, from Frederick, have there been any studies um, carried out on sprinkler impacts of mass timber on structures? There appears to be a lot of studies on its behavior when exposed to fire, but not the behavior when sprinklers are installed. Um, yeah, there have been. Um, I suppose the three that come to mind um, were as part of the US Forest Service ICC tests, which are available online. If you go to the um, ICC, it's called the ICC International Code Council Ad Hoc Committee on Tallwood Buildings, if you Google that. Um, if you go to their website, if you click scroll down, you can see reports. And if you go into that, you can find the reports on um, the, um, the large scale experiments they did. Um, it's also available for, from the Forest Products Laboratory as well, who managed those tests. They did two tests with sprinklers. One of them just had um, all the timber exposed and the fuel as per normal um, and installed a, a light hazard sprinkler system. Did the ignition the same as the first two tests? It was, it was the third test in series. Um, sprinkler activated after I think a couple of minutes, two and a half minutes, and then extinguished the fire. Um, so that was the one test they did. Um, and then, um, oh, sorry, it was the fourth test, not the third test, it was the fourth test. And then the fifth test was also um, particularly interesting one where the sprinkler system was installed and the decision was to delay the sprinkler system by 20 minutes on the basis that um, the fire department response um, occurred to a building which had a fire alarm but the sprinkler system wasn't active that the water was actually um, turned off and so therefore the scenario was the fire department turn up understand there's a sprinkler system that isn't working there's a fire obviously going on and then they would activate the um, the water after that so they had the same build same situation all was, the timber was exposed the same ignition situation um, and then burnt for 20 minutes and then they turned and you know, manually activated the sprinkler and again Within a couple of minutes after that, the fire was suppressed and um, the, and yeah, it was controlled and suppressed. Um, the last one that I can think of um, that, that I know of, there may be others, was um, the recent tests which um, Arup carried out with Cerebrum Imperial. And as one of those tests, we actually installed a mist system into the compartment. So we've got exposed um, CLT ceilings. Um, we had a light hazard mist system. We had a wood crib, which was around I think about 520 or so uh, megajoules per square meter. Um, and again, um, in that situation, the, um, the mist system activated, um, activated a number of heads, um, controlled the fire and extinguished the fire. I think five heads were activated. Um, and um, the timber was you know, slightly scorched above where the fire was, but um, otherwise it was pretty much undamaged. So it shows that sprinkler systems and mist systems are working very effectively with um, exposed timber, which is really, really positive. Um, I might jump next question, um, just simply because I might get to the next one. Um, from Thomas, is there published data for flame spread over timber walls and facades? Um, there is quite a lot, actually. I've got um, a small collection. I, pretty much collect any paper out there, which is to do with um, mass timber. And there's quite a number of um, papers which have been published on facades and fire tests on facades. There's been quite a lot of research that's been carried out um, in Scandinavia, um, in Sweden, um, in Norway, and a few other countries looking at um, exposed timber facades, mainly on low rise buildings, but understanding you know, where, how, the, how the fire spread occurs and looking at you know fire breaks and, and fire stops and various different ways to be able to stop fire spread up a facade. And also there's been quite a number of research papers in Japan looking at similar sort of things and understanding how fire spreads and facades. So I think the answer is, yeah, there is, I would say there's, I've probably got 20 or 30 papers looking at it, um, probably dating back more than 20 years, I suppose. So there is information, um, most of it's related to low rise and most of it's looking at specific sort of situations of timber and looking at the ways that facades can be treated to prevent fire spread, um, you know, progressing and mitigating up facades. Um, there is more work continuing to, uh, with that. The rise work, as I mentioned earlier, certainly um, I think is important in that. And um, I think there are continuing research papers looking at um, different types of combustible facades. Obviously, there's a lot more work in that area, but timber is part of that as well. So, okay. Um, 
getting close to time, so I might just add yeah, one more. Uh, yeah. yeah, one more, I think, yes. and then we wrap up. Okay, the question from Jettle. Thanks for the presentation, David. Thank you, Jettle. Very nice of you to, to um, drop in a presentation. Um, drop in a question. Um, just a note on the test with the delayed sprint corporation from memory, the ventilation condition differed in fact with firing and results. Yes, they did actually, you're right. So um, they actually had a, um, a facade on the front of the ventilation to make it look like a more realistic fire. So that's correct, they did. So um, the fire was quite underventilated um, and the fire actually didn't grow very well. So um, everyone was standing around looking pretty disappointed. So a couple of the um, firefighting guys came out with sledgehammer and smashed a big hole in the glazing, um, which instantly produced a pretty realistic fire. Um, so it went, it carried along for a while. The guy smashed, <laughs> smashed the hole in the glazing. The fire then got going and then three or four minutes later, when it came to the 20 minutes, they, they then put the sprinkler on. So it was, a, it was quite entertaining last test that one. So, um, yeah. Um, so, Steve Ross, should we wrap it up there? Is that, is that what we're going to do? Uh, it's, it's really up to you. I mean, I'm happy to extend the meeting up for, for a few more minutes if you want to answer the last question that came through from um, Matthew. Yeah, might as well. Exactly. Let's have a look. Um, you mentioned that we need simple guides and codes for architects, design, mass timber buildings to move into mainstream and maximize the carbon capture benefits of construction. But don't we and Oz already have a code for design of mass timber and BCA DTS provisions, spec C30, yes, we do. Or is the specification not fit for purpose because the architects always want the mass timber exposed? Yes, I think you've answered your own question there, Matthew. Um, totally agree. You know, I, I mean, we do, and I think you know, it's one of those things we need codes to tell us, you know, what a building should look like. It should have, you know, 60 minute rated, should have sprinklers, two exits, should have this, should, you know, whatever it needs. And then we need guides, um, you know, from timber trade organizations and others, which tell us how to build the buildings and kind of give us, you know, solutions that architects and engineers can use and use again and again and repeatable. And that's, you know, that's what the steel industry has been doing for many, many years and why it's, we build very economic steel buildings. We need lots of, you know, uniform connection solutions and wall solutions and, and floor solutions. And that's what we need. Um, I, you know, the answer is in Australia is we have a solution for mass timber buildings. You can build them up to 25 metres, um, but we need to cover up the timber. Um, and that's, um, you know, not what architects want. It's not what owners want, it's not what developers want. They want to see the timber, as I talked about earlier. So, you know, that's part of the, 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 the situation we have is I think from my point of view, we need to have, certainly for lower medium rise buildings, solutions which encourage architects and owners um, to use timber um, and some of them will be using it for you know to get the most sustainable buildings others will be doing it because they like the look of timber and they can sell it and they know that that building will sell out and lease at a higher rate or at least faster than you know the one that slightly you know down the road a little bit further which is out of concrete or steel and that's why they'll pay a little bit more for a timber building because timber buildings are typically more expensive than steel or concrete um, but they'll get the returns and um, they know that it looks different. And that's one of the marketing aspects of timber. So whether it's for sustainability, whether it's just simply to, you know, make a dollar um, and then, you know, on the tech back of that, explain how sustainable your building is. Um, we need to have solutions which allow that to occur. And, uh, you know, we, we need to want, we need to get that change where we get more timber buildings being constructed for those low and medium rise buildings. So, you know, we want to be able to have a situation where that can occur. And I, you know, it's almost Matt, thanks for your question, because, um, you know, Australia is a, is a good example of where we do have a code which does allow it. And, you know, it's a good starting point. We need to progress the code past that, to start to look at how we can have more timber exposed so we can get more buildings constructed. Okay. Thank you, David. We've run, uh, out, we've run out of I, questions. I've run out of talking. I think that's. Been... <laughs> the, I think that was, that's, that's been the most questions we've had in <laughs> in a um, single presentation. Um, I think there was one more from Nick that we got probably missed um, that talks about the still connections between um, uh, well different uh, uh, oh, yeah, timber okay. elements and whether you stand what, what's your stance on intermediate versus uh, localized encapsulation. Yeah, yeah. So, so when we have timber connected to steel, um, I certainly don't think we can use intumescent paint um, in, yeah, a, in, a, <laughs> in a standard kind of way. Um, so, you know, intumescent paint on steel is designed pretty much to keep the steel 
depending on you know what the paint design thickness is and the type of steel to temperatures around 500 550 degrees um and that is not appropriate where it's connected into the timber because we're going to get heat transfer into the timber and if you've got a, a steel connection and a timber connection they're both exposed to the same fire the timber is being exposed to the fire on the outside it's you know it's reducing in cross section um, it's being heated so it's the steel the steel is 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 got the the protection from the intermittent paint that it needs to, to ensure that it stays in place and, and is going to have the protection because it's at, at um, below its critical temperature. But we're getting heat transfer into the timber and the timber has been heated up, you know, through that, that plate or whatever it is that's connecting into it. And it's typically concealed and it's inside. So, um, so if we're protecting the steel with intermittent paint, we've got to be able to design the steel with the amount of protection, whether it's almost paint or spray or board, such that we limit the temperatures in the steel a lot lower. So we've got to design that protection. We can't design it and say we want to, you know, if we want a 60 minute rated connection, it's got to be designed for temperatures which allow and are critical for the timber. Um, so, you know, when it comes to the interfaces between steel and timber, you've got to be very careful. You can't just say we'll have a 60 minute solution on the steel and expect we'll get a rating on the timber because it, that's not going to happen. Also, you'll find that the, the paint manufacturers aren't going to certify or guarantee that whether it's, you know, paint or even spray or board, they will have a solution which will protect the timber that's connecting into it where they're protecting the steel. Um, and that occurs in, I know it occurs in Australia, it occurs in Singapore, and that's the same in Canada and the US. And I expect it's the same in pretty much every country as well, because you know those suppliers know how to what their products are tested for, and they're they're designed for the steel. They're not designed for the timber that's connecting into that. Um, I think separately to that as well, um, you know, when it comes to paints and boards on um, timber, that's a different conversation, and um, I think you know when it comes to the products we're using on um, timber. I think we've you know got a reasonable amount of information on you know fire rated gypsum and plaster boards and some other non combustible boards around timber, um, and we can you know work with those. I think paints are potentially you know a really good area um, where there is a lot more potential to to offer solutions which can protect timber in, in a better way as well. Um, and um, yeah, if only we had some clever people looking at um, looking at how we can, you know, treat um, intermittent paints on timber. I think we'll be really, the place will be a lot better, and I expect we'll probably have that. So, um, you know, there are there is more work being done on intermittent paints on timber, and I think that's really cool, and it needs to be done. And um, I think we will get to a situation where we'll have a better understanding of those products. But I think it's a matter of just understanding the limitations at the moment and being able to design for them, knowing what the failure is of the timber and the steel. Thank you, Dave. That was no, that's fine. Thanks. That was very informative, and I I think it's really hard when we try to compare two different substrate materials as well, and products that they've been designed for for a specific purpose, and you have to look at it as a system. Uh, you can't you can't just look at it individually as well. Um, so I think we we have finished. I I, I hope. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I hope um, as well. It's time for a beer. Uh, yeah, so, we, well, we're for, not, for us over on this side of the world, it's time for a beer. For you, that's it. I agree. On, on the other side, you know, um, we're not accepting you, any more questions. Have a coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and for um, you know answering non-stop forty minutes uh, worth of uh, Q and A. Um, the the presentation will be is recorded and will be made available uh, through our um, YouTube channel, the SFP. Um, UQ uh, student chapter um, in due course, I believe, if not tomorrow, um, uh, by early next week. For those who, who missed it, I want to revisit a few things. Um, David, do you have you got your details at the end? I think it, you you presented. If someone wants to contact you as well, yep. Yeah. yeah. Right. So yeah, my email address. Um, it's pretty simple. It's David Barber at Arab .com. So. Yeah, very simple. So, but it's at the end of the presentation as well. So, um, feel free to reach out to me or just you know send me a send me a message on LinkedIn if the worst comes to worst. So, yeah, happy to happy to provide information if I can or point you in the direction of someone else who who can provide the information. If I can't always answer every question, so I'm happy <laughs> to get other people to answer. Them, so, excellent. Thank you so yeah. much, David. No um, worries. Thanks, guys. Have, have a great evening. Yeah, thank I'll you. catch you all next time. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Bye.